entering in to what is now called Statuary Hall, but for most of its history, it was the house chamber. And here where we have an arch, that used to be solid wall, but the south end of the Capitol was being constructed in the 1850s. And the, that, those middle doors there take you into the middle of the house chamber. They're the same doors that the president goes through when he goes to deliver say the union address, uh, foreign leaders, if they're invited to speak in the house chamber, they go through those doors. But until the late 1850s, this was the south end of the Capitol. And there was a partition or wall between these two pillars here. And then on this side was an elevated platform for the Speaker of the House. The Speaker's chair was up in here, kind of like a throne, um, or kind of like the, the House of Commons in England. And then back here is just an area where members of the House could uh, go to talk because you're not supposed to talk out here on the House floor. And then to get a, a semblance, a, a, an idea of what it looked like, you look with me around this chamber. Now you see statues all around the perimeter. Every state gets to choose two statues, totally up to the individual states um, whom those statues are. But when the House of Representatives met in here, there were no statues and there was a, a rail around the back of this white black marble floor and uh, there were semicircle rows of desks facing up here to the speaker and as i say the speaker elevated up here uh, there are brass plates here on the floor where somebody sat when they were in the house of representatives if they later became president so there are a number of plaques. Um, poor Millard Fillmore, he doesn't get much uh, attention these days, but he was one of our presidents. But the most uh, photographed and noticed point is right over here where John Quincy Adams sat while he was in the House of Representatives. Now, John Quincy Adams, as it says, 1831 to 1848, John Quincy Adams was a very ethical, moral, and actually brilliant man. Uh, he wrote history books uh, in German. He loved the French language. Um, and actually, he was the only president we'd ever had who married someone who was not born in the United States. Uh, he was not an American originally. Uh, I understand that's happened since then once more, but I'm being facetious. Uh, Donald Trump obviously is the second president to have married a woman who wasn't born and raised in America. So John Quincy, and, that, and really the reason John Quincy Adams didn't marry an American was because of his mother Abigail, didn't like the guy he was crazy in love with in Massachusetts, so she ends up talking John into uh, helping her send John Quincy to England to live with friends and get educated over there. And he ends up falling in love. I think she was the second oldest daughter. And that was a little prickly because the oldest daughter was supposed to get married first, uh, but he wanted the second daughter. Well, ultimately it worked out, they married and she was brilliant and uh, of course she spoke multiple languages too like our current first lady but john quincy adams was elected president in 1824 and it was a case uh, an election in fact that was thrown to the house of representatives because no candidate got a majority of the electoral college votes when it was up to the House to decide who's going to end up being president, John Quincy Adams 
uh, got the endorsement of Henry Clay. Clay was known to be uh, a powerful leader in the House. And when he threw his support behind John Quincy Adams, that ended up getting uh, Adams the votes he needed to become president. Adams, uh, as president, wanted to appoint Henry Clay to be the Secretary of State. His close friends advised him, John Quincy, that is a terrible idea. Everybody knows you won the election when Henry Clay threw his support to you. If you appoint him with what most people at that time thought was the plum cabinet position, the Secretary of State, people will assume you had a quid pro quo deal. Well, Adams was a very moral, ethical person. And that really infuriated him. He said, anybody that knows me, and I'm speaking figuratively, not exact quotes, but basically, people that know me know I would not do something unethical, illegal. We had no deal. Uh, but he is the best person. That's the person I want as Secretary of State. So he ends up appointing Henry Clay as Secretary of State. People went ballistic. So there was a deal. You made a deal with Clay, he throw your, his support to you. You make him Secretary of State. Adams persisted ever and always. He never made a deal. He wouldn't do anything like that. But it so inflamed even some of his own friends that as president, he got very little accomplished. In fact, there were some people that had bills that they had filed and when Adams expressed support, they withdrew the bills. I mean, it, uh, it was a tough time and it was a very, very difficult presidency. In any event, 1828, I'm sorry, yeah, 1828, he gets defeated by Andrew Jackson. So he's done. Everybody knows, once you get defeated as president, you're over. Well, unless maybe you're Grover Cleveland, but, uh, or Teddy Roosevelt, but people get out of politics. Well, John Quincy Adams went back to his home, and two years later, he ran for the House of Representatives. He had corresponded with a guy named William Wilberforce in England. He had the idea that God may have had it for him to do for America what William Wilberforce did for England. Wilberforce got elected in his 20s to be in Parliament. He fought for years to get the slave trade eliminated to end slavery. He eventually got a partial victory by having the slave trade outlawed. But it wasn't until three days before he died, uh, 1833, I believe, uh, that Parliament banished all slavery, made all slavery illegally or illegal. And so that's what he thought he was, I'm supposed to end slavery. So he got elected. He was supposedly prouder of being elected to be a member of the House of Representatives than he was being elected president. Some might think that's strange, but what it means is when, after his presidency was over, his neighbors still liked him. How many presidents do you find that go back to their own town after they leave the presidency? John Quincy Adams did. He was elected nine times, two-year terms, nine times. And he was constantly filing bills to end slavery. He just couldn't believe, he couldn't convince the whole house in this chamber to join him in bringing an end to slavery. It was just so wrong. How could God keep blessing America while we're putting brothers and sisters in chains? It just, it didn't go. It had to stop and he knew that and he pushed that. And at one point he filed so many bills that uh, he called it a gag rule that the house put on him where he couldn't keep filing bills that, 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 similar to those he'd already filed. Uh, so he ended up fighting for a long time against his Adams gag rule so he could go back to trying to preach to end slavery. And even on his last day in the house, and I didn't know till I read a, another biography on him a couple of years ago, but he, he couldn't see very well there at the end. 
uh, and he could no longer write in his journal. We know so much about what he thought because he kept more of a journal than anybody back in childhood. But he could no longer write in his journal. And so he asked his wife, Louisa, I can't sleep. Would you just pick any one of William Wilberforce's sermons and read them to me? Read me a sermon by Wilberforce. And he finally dozed off the last night at home listening to a sermon by William Wilberforce. So the next day he's here. The topic is war with Mexico. He's strongly against war with Mexico. John Quincy Adams' position is if we go to war with Mexico, it's only going to perpetuate slavery. We got to end slavery. But he got recognized to speak. He took hold of his desk with both hands, began to push himself up. And as he nearly became erect, he lost his balance, apparently had a massive stroke. The guys caught him and they carried him through that door right back over there. That's now the women's lounge, Congressional Women's Lounge. But at the time, it was the speaker suite of offices, and they put him on a couch back there. It's still there. It's been recovered time or two. But they took care of him for two days. He said something like uh, he was at peace, and some thought that was a little strange because he hadn't done what he thought God called him to do. He had uh, fought for over 17 years here to end slavery. It's 1848, we're 13 years away at that point from swearing in the new president that's gonna end slavery. So he didn't accomplish what he worked for all those years to accomplish. But, as a guy named Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story is back here at the back. Well, that's where Franklin Pierce sat when he was in the house. But now Father Sarah is back here. Father Sarah was uh, canonized as a saint by the Pope, uh, brought Christianity to the far west. But again, none of these statues were here when the house was meeting here. I've heard some people say, well, you know, Abraham Lincoln never won any election until he became president. And that's not quite true. In 1846, Abraham Lincoln won a two-year term in the House of Representatives. And as a freshman, here he was, this is the back row. And keep in mind, you know, this was gallery back here. There was, the rail was right here. And so that wasn't a very choice seat to be right in front of all the gawking people. You could be in the gallery above, or you could be behind the rail here. So. Abraham Lincoln sat here, and of course that was before he had the beard. He hadn't gotten a letter from the girl recommending that. I've had people tell me I'd look better with a beard, some, anything to cover my face, but that's uh, another subject for another day. So he gets, as the plaque says, he served 1847 to 1849. And by the election of 1848, he had no chance of being reelected no way he was going to get reelected. And that appeared to be the end of his career. And I've read some say that ended any thought about politics because he just couldn't get elected again. But he overlapped with that guy, John Quincy Adams, that was right up there where we were. And uh, I've asked, uh, I've read, I've heard stories, and I asked Steve Mansfield, a great historian, great author, um, has a, a book on Lincoln's struggle with God, or fight with God. Um, Adams liked Lincoln, took him under his wing, mentored him, and Lincoln liked Adams. Now, Adams was kind of a crotchety guy. 
what, what some might call today a uh, porcupine Christian means um, he's not he's got a lot of good points but nobody really liked to get close to him Adams could be kind of crotchety but he liked Lincoln took him under his wing Lincoln loved the things that Adams said and after Lincoln was sworn in as president 13 years after he died um, according to what Steve Mansfield was telling me that uh, he wasn't sure if he ever answered a question like this, but it was very clear that the most important thing that happened during Abraham Lincoln's two years in this room were the powerful sermons John Quincy Adams stood right there and delivered over and over and over about the evils of slavery. John Quincy Adams did not get done what he thought he was supposed to bring an end to slavery. But there is absolutely no question he materially changed the man that did get it done, who sat right back there during those speeches for much of the last year of John Quincy Adams' life.